found it, please stand for the reading of God's word. We're really going to be focusing on verses 3 through 9. However, I do want to read verses 1 to 14. Hear now the word of God. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, reserved in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, in which you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom not seeing you love, though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of the Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, in the things that have now been announced to you, who through those preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. Therefore, having girded up the loins of your mind and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Well, this is the reading of God's word. Please remain standing as we pray. Father, we would come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, with boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. And as Cliff also prayed from Ephesians 3, we would just ask, Lord, would you pour out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit the love of God? And so, Father, I just ask that you would help us to stay our minds upon Jesus. You say you will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you, because he or she trusts in you. Trust in Yahweh, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Father, we just ask as your word now is read and as it is exposited, that you may draw us with cords of love to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you help us to behold him? Would you help us to look upon him, gaze upon him, and that our hearts would overflow with adoration and love and worship and praise and even recommitment. Father, would you so work in our affections that we would no longer desire lesser loves, that the things of, of earth would grow strangely dim. And so, Father, in 2024, as cold as it is, would you warm our hearts? I couldn't help but think of the two on the road to Emmaus, 
how when they understood Christ in their presence, their hearts burned. Lord, that's what I would ask that you would accomplish for us this morning. And lastly, Lord, if there's those this morning who have come here, maybe not a Christian, would you be pleased, Lord? Would you corral them, corridor them? Would you, would you squeeze them into a, a narrow way that you would irresistibly draw them to Christ in the cords of love? That they would gladly and willingly say, here I am. You have my heart. I will bow my knee. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Father, help me now this morning. All I want to do is to, to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, or even in the words of Peter. I want to proclaim and announce and declare the glories of Christ, the one who brought us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Holy Spirit, you can do this, and I ask that you would, not only from the preacher, but Lord, also to the hearer. May we all glorify you this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I had originally intended this week to preach from Proverbs chapter 8 on the fear of the Lord, which is the hatred of evil. But as we saw last week, as we looked upon the doctrine of providence, the Lord saw fit to call an audible and so I thought this would be pastorally wise and sensitive but to preach on something that we can all identify with or that we will all identify with, and that is just trials, afflictions, sorrow, heavy hearts. And if you're not now smarting or if you're now not in the throes of sorrow, you probably know someone who is, or I guarantee you will one day be in those. Couldn't help but think of a pa couple passages in Job 5.7. It says that, 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 that trials and troubles, they sort of spring up in life the way sparks do from the fire. Or, as Job himself says in 14.1, it says that man, born of woman, is short in life but full of trouble. And unfortunately, in a fallen world, that is the lot of all, Christian and non-Christian alike. And so my desire is to help us think Christianly about trials. And it's no accident that I read verses 1 and 2 because we have to see God rightly. If we're not seeing God rightly, we will interpret our trials wrongly. Now, by way of maybe a, a light little analogy, Saturday, we're sitting around. No, it was Friday. Sorry. We're sitting around. It's cold. It's very cold. And there's a knock on the door. And if you're anything like me, when you're just in a, in a funk, you just don't want to answer the door. You're just assuming it's someone who wants to sell you something. Though, if someone's trying to sell you something in that kind of cold, you should buy it. But we're sitting there, and the girls were laughing because the skip the dishes uh, driver, he, he, he was hitting a piece of, of uh, fabric that wasn't the doorbell. And whether it was right for them to laugh or not, I don't know. But he was persistent. He wouldn't go away. And then he started knocking on the door and ringing that silly bell we have beside the door. And finally, I got up. And what was initially something that was unexpected and even unwelcome turned out to be a wonderful blessing in disguise. For he had with him a bag of hot pizza with breadsticks that someone had bought for us to help us in our grief. And that's what trials can be like. I thought that was a wonderful analogy. They're, they're unexpected and oftentimes unwelcome. But in the words of Cooper, ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and soon shall break with blessings on your head. God does move in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. And part of these wonders he performs are affliction and trials and troubles. And Peter is writing to people who are going through this. This is written probably right before the severe trials of Nero bring on onslaught against the Christians. However, these Christians, 30 years after Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out, had heard this good news announced, this gospel of how they can be reconciled irrespective of their ethnicity, that they could be forgiven of their sins and reconciled to a holy God through Christ and faith in the gospel. It came with a cost. 
Now, they were now the laughing stock of culture, whether Jew or Gentile. A lot of these believers in Asia Minor were losing friends, losing family, perhaps not offered the same uh, opportunities, whether for work or other things. And they were living, as it were, as exiles. They were the off-scouring and scourge of the world, and that they're being slandered, talked against, even physically persecuted. And perhaps like us, when we were going through trials, they were wondering, where is God in this? Does God really care? I, I know I've heard that, but it sure doesn't feel like it. It sure doesn't look like it. And what I think Peter is doing for us is teaching us how to walk through triumphantly the inevitability of trials. They're, they're coming. They're not reserved for believers or unbelievers. Living in a, in a post-Genesis 3 world that has fallen, in a, in a world that is characterized by tears and grief and mourning and sorrow, yes, tangled with, mingled with joy and laughter, but there's just a heaviness and a sadness. There's a, a shroud, Isaiah 25 says, that still lingers and looms over us. And so what Peter is doing is he's reminding these scattered exiles, these believers, that God is sovereign and God cares for them. That he is a wise physician and a good doctor and he knows what he's doing and he has a purpose. A purpose that goes all the way back into eternity past and a purpose that will be fully realized in eternity future, but not till then. And so he's giving them what I would call a heavenly hermeneutic. It's a fancy word, hermeneutic. It, 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 it's a, a means by which you interpret things. And so you would say we have a biblical hermeneutic. We come to the Bible and we interpret it a certain way based on how we see things. And we, we might think of it as wearing glasses. Last week I talked about the rose-colored glasses of providence, seeing everything as it were through God's sovereignty. Well, trials as well. But I, I want to sort of tweak that a bit and call this not just a, a, a hermeneutic of God's sovereignty, <laughs> but I want to call this the heavenly hermeneutic. In the language of Paul to the Colossians, set your minds on things that are above. Seek those things. And I want you to understand, that's what trials do. They're a, a wonderful winnower of our desires. They're a wonderful, painful, as it were, file that gets rid of a lot of the rough edges. It, it, it's that... That, that, that hammer and chisel, it hurts, but is often so necessary for God to accomplish his purposes for us. And so I want you to see, Christian, your trials through this heavenly hermeneutic. Peter's constantly pointing us forward. And I want you to understand that, that the gospel is good news. That's, that's what euangelion means. It, it's news of goodness. But it's not just good news that has happened in the past. It's also good news of a promise for the future. And we need to, yes, look back and by faith, trust in what Christ has done for us. That he has once for all dealt with our sins. That he is the one of Isaiah 53, who, who has died for us and drawn us to himself. But the gospel is also forward-looking. There's a future component to it. And as I've said once, and I've said a thousand times, living in the present rightly requires us to look not only to the past rightly, what Christ has done, but also looking to the future rightly, what God will do when Christ returns. And so you're going to see that as we work through this text. It will help us to rejoice in our trials. It will help us to have, in the language of Peter, a joy that is inexpressible. And that has glory in it. And this glory is something that is in the heavens. And by faith, as it were, we celebrate in that heavenly glory, even on earth, through tears and trials. I think this is something that preaches well to us because this is something that we all have, are, or will go through. So Peter, he's reminding us that he has the authority of God Almighty as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to preach through verses 1 and 2, but I do want to remind you that they are helpful to, to, to show us 
who the God is that is planning these trials for us. Listen to how Peter describes him. He is the God and Father who knows us and foreknew us. Do you see that in verse 2? These exiles who are elect, they have been scattered. They seem like maybe orphans. They have a father. That they are not only elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, they are exiles according to God the Father. And we need to, to remember the fatherliness of God. We have also been set apart by the Spirit. Not only in our salvation, but we are elect exiles in the sanctification of the Spirit. Or if you have an NIV, by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And so you need to see trials this way. right? You're you're in a trial, right? You you feel like you're maybe in in the slew of despond. Or maybe you're in some kind of pit like Hezekiah. Well, God here... Well, he is the father who chose you in eternity past. Foreknowledge is a beautiful word. It's not just looking down the corners of time. It's God setting his electing love on you. And you need to remember that. That you're elect according to his foreknowledge, but also going through this trial. Not according to some knowledge he knows about from a distance, but one that he is intimately acquainted with and personally involved with. He loves you in the trial. And the Spirit is working in the trial to make you holy. That's why I read that verse. Be holy. For the one who has called you is holy. And so he actually gives you trials to make you holy because you have been called for obedience and to be sprinkled. And sometimes trials, they wake us up because something is important. I remember when I was in India and we didn't want to miss a connecting flight, but we had to, so I was staying with Vijaya in Hyderabad, and we could not miss a connecting flight. And so we asked for that, what you call a courtesy call. There's nothing courteous about being woken up early at four in the morning. But there was something so important that we were willing to undergo discomfort that we might not miss this. And sometimes that's what trials are for us. It's a courtesy call where God says, wake up. There's something so important I don't want you to miss. And yes, you don't like being, you know, put in this situation. But there's a purpose in the courtesy call. And it comes not only from a loving father, but it's in the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. And the trials, this heavenly hermeneutic, help us to understand their for obedience. If you were to go home and read Peter, he says, he says things like this. That, that we are to, to be obedient and to no longer live in the former ignorance of the traditions we learned from our fathers, or we're to not live in the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. Trials remind us about that. So sometimes we're walking in a manner that is not consistent or worthy of the gospel, and God gives us trials. And so what Peter does before he pastorally ministers to these Exiles, as he reminds us who God is. Never forget. Never forget who God is. Sometimes in the trial, that's the first thing we jettison. It's how much God, as Father and Son and Spirit, loves us. We forget he has a purpose for us. We forget that he does care for us. And so right off the bat, Peter begins, Blessed be the God and Father. Peter, we already know. God is Father. Why do you keep repeating that? Because sometimes we can become so dull of hearing. We have amnesia, gospel amnesia, which is why I would encourage you, even when you don't feel like going to that Bible study, even when you don't feel like reading your devotional, even when you don't feel like coming to church on Sunday, write it. Christian life, as Jason Meyer says, is a fight for sight. And so what Peter is doing is he's putting before them who God is. Because trials are screaming. 
whether in persecution or the loss of a loved one. Maybe you don't like being mocked. I don't know what trial God will put you through. But it will be a fight for sight. And so rather than focusing on the trials, Peter doesn't ignore them. He's a good pastor. He doesn't just pretend that there's, there's hey, you know, pull up your pants and just be a man. No, he, he acknowledges we go through trials. But what he does is he presents before these suffering saints who God is, as Father and Son and Spirit. And so again, he reminds us of the fatherliness of God. Blessed, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's important because Jesus Christ in the book of First Peter is presented to us as an example and a type. Does the Father not love the Son? His entire ministry was one of suffering. Yes, climaxed on the cross. Does the Father not care for the Son or have a purpose for Him? Well, of course He does. He is not just our Father, but He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who would go to the cross, the one who, being righteous, would die for us who are unrighteous to bring us to this Father. Never forget that God the Father is God the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And this one who has great mercy. Sometimes we feel in trials that there isn't a lot of mercy. But Paul alone doesn't get to use this in Ephesians 2. Peter loves to use this. In accordance with, out of, this treasury, which is infinite in stock, he has great mercy. And when you feel that God doesn't love you, remember what he has done. Remember by faith the gospel past, what he has done for you in Christ. How the Spirit drew you in the cords of love in regeneration. He caused you to be born again. He didn't invite you to be born again. Oh, how we love this love. He has caused us to be born again to what? To a living hope. And as providentially Cliff reminded us from even Hezekiah, who was only given 15 years more, in Christ we are given infinitely more than 15 years. You might have a cancer diagnosis and you might only be given 15 hours more. I don't know. But because he is the resurrection and the life, you will praise him forever and ever and ever because your hope does not die in your death. Your hope ever lives because it is in Christ the living one, the one who conquered death. You have a living hope. Why? Because you're in the living one. You have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There were Christians being martyred. There were Christians who were dying. But praise be to God. This heavenly hermeneutic reminds us we have not just any old hope. We have a living hope. And let me pause here for a moment. If you're not in Christ, you don't have a living hope. You have a perishing hope. If your hope is only in something like retirement, those funds, they will be used up. Or they won't be used up. But you will die and they'll be squandered. And like Solomon says, you will give your wealth to another. Your hope might be in health. Trust me, anyone who's over 40, that gets quashed right away. Your, your hope might be in a person, or in your job, or in your country. Those things are all perishing hopes. They're like the, the grass that withers and like the flower of grass that falls. But if you're in Christ, you have a living and inconquerable hope. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Our hope transcends the grave because Christ has conquered it. Peter reminds us that even in trials, we have something reserved for us. Again, these elect exiles who are scattered abroad, who've maybe lost everything for the sake of the name, maybe they've lost their house or their inheritance. And so what does this heavenly hermeneutic do? It causes us, again, to seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand. 
Christ has merited, he has earned that inheritance. The promised land that the Jews were longing for is so much more than a small geographical plot of land called Palestine. It's a new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells, where there are no more tears, no more sorrow because there is no more sin there. That is what you keep your eye on. No more death there. What is this inheritance that we fix our gaze upon by faith? What is this hope? This is an inheritance that is ours in Christ, Ephesians 1. Three things, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. I'm so thankful for all three of those. Not only is it eternal, but it's undefilable. Right? You get your new vehicle and pretend it lasts forever, but there's just an ugly scratch on it. Now you've got an ugly scratch on it forever. Well, this inheritance the Father not only offers, He gives and preserves. It is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, reserved, having been kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded. You know what you need to remember? That in your trial, you are being guarded. By power. Oh, like my power? No, if you're guarded by your power, you'll be renouncing your faith in a heartbeat. You will be sullen and sorrowful. Right? You'll be that guy who's walking over his bottom lip all day. But you need to remember that, that the one who called you, the one who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion. That Jesus is not only the author of your salvation, he is also the finisher, the perfecter. And as we saw in Sunday school, he will lose none of all that the Father has given him, but will most certainly raise them up on the last day. You, Christian, you are being guarded. Here it is, through faith. This has been a long, convoluted introduction. I don't know if, if I've lost you or not. I hope not. But I'm a marker up of my Bible. And as we learned yesterday from Brother Ben teaching us how to preach, look for repetition in the text. And so I've got circled in my Bible, faith, 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 three times in this section. Next section is this call to holiness, hope, hope, hope. And so I want you to think with me this morning as we're going through trials. Why, God? Why are you putting me through a trial? Do you not love me? Well, pastor already said. That you're elected according to the foreknowledge and the forelove of God. That's not in question. God does love you. And he does have a wonderful purpose for you. This purpose is holiness in this life. And perfection in the life to come. And as we're making our pilgrim journey. From as it were Jerusalem to new Jerusalem. From, from, from earth to new heavens and earth. That we walk by faith. And we're purified by faith. And it's all built and predicated upon faith. Faith is so crucial. We're not only saved by faith, we're sanctified by faith. And we're glorified by faith. And because faith is so precious to God and us, God gives us trials to refine that faith. Faith might not be important to you this morning. It sure is to God. How will you make it to the end? Well, by God's power. And through faith. And there's that tension that we just have to wrestle with. God's sovereignty and our responsibility. I'm not just saying, hey, let go and let God. You will make it to the end. By God's power, through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed. And you're like, what? No, I am saved. Right? Like, I remember, I call upon the name Lord. Whoever calls upon the name Lord will be saved. So what's this future salvation Peter's talking about? It's the same future salvation that all the writers of Scripture talk about. That we taste of this so great a salvation now in part. And when Christ returns with the new heavens and the new earth, we taste of it fully and perfectly in the age to come. Which is what we're groaning for. It's the now and the not yet. You have been saved. You are being saved. You will be saved. And to get us on from the have been saved to the will be saved, we walk along the path of faith. 
That's how God keeps us on the straight and narrow. The guardrails of trials. Oh, how unwelcome they might be, but oh, how necessary. Let us not judge the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind that frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Face. So here it is, we're being kept, being guarded through faith. Keep, keep that idea of faith in your mind. Verse 6, in which you rejoice. Verses 3 through 9, one verse, or, or one sentence in Greek. That's, I tried to read it that way, which is why I've not broken this up into various sections. But Peter's reminding us of this heavenly harmony. You will make it by faith. And so what God's going to do is he's going to give you trial to strengthen your faith. And to shore up your assurance. Verse 6, in which you rejoice. What? How can you rejoice in calamity and in trial? How can you rejoice in suffering? Because what God is doing through trials, so I started going to a chiropractor. Don't start saying it's good or bad yet. I'm just using it as an illustration that literally just came to mind. And I... A lot of you know, like, I got a stiff neck, right? Not, his, not Israelite style, but right? I, can, I can barely turn it like this. And so what, what, what she's been doing is she puts me on, on, the, on my back, and then she cracks my neck so I can look upward. The first time that happened, I, almost, like, I was like seeing stars. I had to put ice pack on my neck. Trials are like that. She, right? God sometimes has to crack our neck so we can look up. Because we're just so constantly looking at the here and now. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, we must walk by faith. And faith is on those promises, not only that God has given us in Christ in the gospel in the past, but also those gospel promises that God gives us when Christ returns. That's the beauty of the table. All, all that we have now is not all that there is. And so God cracks our neck so we can look upward. And yes, it hurts, but oh, how thankful I am that I can actually move my neck around and shoulder check so I don't imperil my family every time I drive. In this you rejoice, not in the trials, but in the salvation. When you're studying sentences, what is the this? What is the referent? The salvation ready to be revealed. Trials make you groan and long for a new heavens and a new earth. Pastor Cliff said this life is a vapor. Why would we put all of our investments and stocks into a vapor? God reminds us that eternity awaits. And we must live for that in the now. In this you are rejoicing. Present tense, not just here and there. But you are rejoicing, though now for a little while. Let me just give you some things that Peter says about the trials you are going through. Or someone you love is going through. Or something you will go through. I promised you this. Not because I'm a prophet. But because I believe the Bible. And two, I'm just a living human being. Living in a broken, fallen world. Are you going through a trial? Well, Paul, Paul, Peter would have you rejoice to remember that this trial is a little while. Oh, you mean like I'll get healed today? Is that what you're saying, Pastor? I don't know. God knows what he's doing. Some of you might be plagued by a trial until you take your last breath or Jesus returns. However, if you have a heavenly hermeneutic, you can now see this trial much differently. Not only in how severe it is, but even its duration. And some of you are probably are wondering, I wonder if he's going to turn us to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Yeah, I am going to. Very good. So you can turn there. The trial you are going through, that God is working together for good, right? God's got a purpose for you, and that purpose is to conform you into the image of Christ. We saw that. What about Paul? Doesn't God love Paul? Yeah, Paul, I've called you as a vessel of election to show you how much you must suffer for the sake of my name. And in one of my favorite books of the entire Bible, 
because it usually links pastoral ministry or gospel work to a life of, 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 of suffering. He says this, that we will share in the glory of God. And then in verse 16, it says, so we do not lose heart. Or you might translate that, we are not despairing. Right? When trial hits, are you, maybe you're like me, I'm a despairing kind of guy. Like I did not want to get up and answer the door. I'm just, I just want to, I just, just want to be puddle glum. Sometimes I need to have some fires and sparks under my feet to remind me of Aslan. But Paul says, as the apostle and his cohort, we are not losing heart, though our outer self. So here's Paul's heavenly hermeneutic living in a life of suffering. Right? Just read 2 Corinthians. We despaired even of life itself, he says in 1A. And yet we do not lose heart. Though our outer self, literally outer man, that old Adamic nature, is wasting away, our inner is being renewed day by day. For this what? This light, momentary affliction. In comparison, well, keep going, Pastor. Stop, stop, stopping. For this light, momentary affliction. Affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And so what Paul and Peter are doing is they're saying we've got scales here. On one side of the scale, you young people, you have no idea what I'm doing here. Right? But when I was in high school, that's what old people do, when I was, we, we, had, the, we had the old school scales where you, you've got a balance and a balance Right? And you'd, you'd sort of calibrate it, and then you would put something on this side and something on this side. And that's what, that's what the authors of scriptures they're doing. They're like, you've got a lot of trials piling up on this side, right? So if, if you don't know what I'm doing, just YouTube it, right? And so you've got all these afflictions, right? And it seems to putting the, the, the scale out of balance. And what Paul has actually done is he's actually put glory on this side. Trials and trials and trials, and they just seem incalculable. Right? They just won't stop, and it just seems bang. And Paul actually says, a heavenly hermeneutic reminds us that these trials, which seem so severe, they're, they're slight and they're momentary when compared to glory. When Peter says we rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and glory-filled, that's what he's saying here. You're putting glory on the other side of the scale. And it helps you to now not only live and get by, but it helps you to live with joy and rejoicing. Not because the trial's gone away, but because you now see it rightly. It reminds you that this world is a vapor. There's an eternal weight. How much does the glory of God weigh? I can't calculate it. I, don't got, I just don't, I don't have a scale big enough. Because it's eternal. And you can't compare it. Verse 18 begins with what you call a participle. Don't you love inspired grammar? I do. Right? It's an objective reality. God's glory far away and outstrips whatever we're going through. However, that doesn't apply to us. Unless we understand that by faith in verse 18. I love how the ESV starts the sentence with ah. It's beyond all comparison as we are looking. How you live is a fight for sight. What are you looking to? And the trial screams, look to me, look to me and be miserable all ye ends of the earth. Whereas the gospel says, look to me. And be saved all ends of the earth because Christ is speaking. And so that's why we gather on the Lord's Day. Not to hear about a pastor's story. We come to gather around the word. We come to see the gospel. We come to taste the gospel. We come to enjoy the gospel. We come to celebrate the gospel because it reorients us. It cracks our neck upward again. And by faith, again, we look not to the things that are seen. And some of you are suffering a thousand times more than I am. 
get it. May God's grace and love overflow for you. That you might look not to the circumstances which are temporal, but to the glory that is eternal. Is that what he says? As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Though we do not see him, we love him. Though we do not now see him, we believe in him. And believing in the unseen one produces joy. And that's what Paul is saying. For the things that are seen are transient. One day you will thank the Lord for the trials you're going through. Because he began to reorient you. And you began to put your hope in the things that will pay off. Most certainly. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Quickly back to 1 Peter. I'm just working through this. Just helping you think through your trials. Maybe you can come alongside and counsel someone who's going through this, that, that you'll be gracious and listen to them and have this in the back of your mind. You're not going to be a Bildad, Eliphaz, or Zophar, but you'll be able to give them true hope in Christ, to remind them, or at least pray for God to show them that their trials are just a little while. Next, their trials are necessary, verse 6. Though for now, a little while, if necessary... I'm not going to talk about it, but if, if you've got access to YouTube, don't do it now. That will probably just not make me feel good. But there's a fellow named Joel Tigrin, and he was a missionary, a young fellow with a young family who came down with cancer. Some of us saw it on Media Gratia. And I'll never forget when he was giving his testimony, this verse just he changed it for me. And he says that what I'm going through right now must be necessary. Like if God is sovereign and I'm going through a trial, it must be necessary. Because God makes no mistakes and God knows what he's doing. Right? Like the doctor will say, this is necessary. I'm not doing this because I want to inflict on you some kind of unnecessary pain. No, this is necessary. And that's what Joel said, through tears and in faith, he said, this cancer which did take his life. Right? You think, what's going on, God? God for loved Joel. The Holy Spirit set him apart for himself. And even to the end, he trusted in Christ. He obeyed. And I would say that Joel is rejoicing with a greater joy that is inexpressible because he's tasted more of the glory in the presence of God, in Christ. So these trials, they're short-lived, but oh, so necessary. Thirdly, they're grievous. And lastly, they're various. I just want to remind us as we're doing life together, let God determine the extent and severity of the trial. Don't compare trials. How come they don't get what I've got? Or don't make light of, of a trial that someone's going through. It, it's heavy to them, and God knew that's what they needed. You might think, that's stupid. Why, why are they so broken over that? Because God knew that's exactly what was necessary to break their heart, that he might mend it and restore it. So here's some of the things about trials. But there's one more thing about trials. There's a purpose, right? There's an extent. There's a variety. There's a purpose. And it's to refine your faith. Right? Christ to us is precious. And in a non-blasphemous way, to him our faith is precious. Same word used later. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though is tested by fire. You could even say more precious than Bitcoin. Right? He's saying Bitcoin's going to pass gold soon. Right? And, and how precious it is. Well, as precious as Bitcoin may ever become, it's not as precious as your faith. And so God puts you through the furnace. And he knows just how long to put you and he knows just how long to have the heat. Word of be said, when God puts his saints in the furnace of affliction and trial, he has, his eye on the he has his eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. That quote is helpful. 
Right? The, the guy who's testing the gold, he wants that gold to come out pure, and he doesn't let it stay one second longer than it's needed, and he doesn't make it one degree hotter than is necessary. But he's refining that gold through that fire. And God, through trials, is refining our faith. He knows how long and how hot it needs to be, but there's a purpose in it. And it's not for the Father's amusement. Right? It's not like the, the little kid with the magnifying glass burning ants for fun. This is the Father who loves us as his children, who sent his Son into the world to die for us. He cares for us. And so he tests us. We're salted with fire, says Jesus, that it may be found, here it is, to result in praise. And here's that word again. Like, I'm a marker. Like, trust me. You got like, the Bible marked up. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying, this will help you understand. Glory. You got faith and faith and faith and glory and glory and glory. Faith refines our perspective that we might focus on future glory. Don't feel very glorious in the trial, does it? Well, God's got a purpose. It will result. Your faith will result in praise and glory and honor when at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Just a little bit more. Right, Cliff? Just a little bit more, saint. Though not seeing, you love him. That's what trials do. They refine not only our faith, but they, they help to restructure our loves rightly. Augustine said that sin is disordered love. Re right? what, what, what trials do is they say, oh, right. Why am I so in love with something that's perishing? Why? Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him. Right? Here are these, these, these struggling, suffering saints. We don't know what's going on. But the Holy Spirit who has poured out into our heart, Romans 5, in the context of suffering, reminds us that God in Christ loves us. And we believe in him. The very thing that Satan would seek to use to, to, to ruin our faith, destroy our faith, God works together for good to refine and strengthen and buttress our faith. Why? Because by faith you will get to the end. And so God actually says, your faith is important. Let me give you some trials. It just helps us to receive things. Always let the word of God interpret life for you. No, you do not now see him. You believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. This is a wonderful witness. Why, why would you be crying in, in this? Or why would you be rejoicing in that? Why do you seem so focused on Christ and his return when it seems like there's hell on earth? Because I believe not only his past promises, I believe... His future promises. I believe that Jesus is coming and he's bringing a new heavens and a new earth. I believe that we will feast with Jesus in the house of Zion. I believe that I will look upon him and see him even as he is. I believe he will wipe away every tear from my eye. I believe that I will gather with the saints now in glory and the saints now on earth and we will gather around the Lamb and we will ascribe praise and glory and honor and dominion. I believe that. I believe that all things will fully and finally be made new. I'm not rejoicing because I'm told to. I'm rejoicing because I believe God is not a liar. I believe that he is good. And I am eagerly, painfully, groaningly obtaining, waiting for the outcome of your faith. I would encourage you. You've got a pencil. Just work through the sections. You see this. Faith and faith and faith. And if faith is important and God refines our faith, now you understand what God is up to in your pain and in your affliction and in your trial. You will obtain the salvation of your souls, the very things the prophets in the Old Testament look towards. Let me close this. Verse 13. Now what? <laughs> I, okay, I can, I can just sort of get through and I can, I can interpret my trials properly. I've got, I've got this, this heavenly hermeneutic. It not only helps us to get through the trial, it actually enables us in the trial to be obedient. Because you know what happens in our trials? 
we start to self-medicate. You do that? You ever do that? You're going through something, something happens to you you don't think you deserve? You watch a lot more YouTube than you should. Probably watch a little more Netflix, probably eat way too much Ben and Jerry ice cream. Right, you walk around sulking. It's not enough just for us to have a hermeneutic, but it's also, as it were, to provide for us motivation to holy living. God called us to be holy. And so what Peter's doing as a good pastor is he's helping them interpret their trials properly. But look at verse 13. He says, you have prepared your minds for action. Literally, it's girding up the loins of your mind. It's that picture, uh, right? They didn't have fancy jackets like we have. You know, they didn't wear the, the attire we had. They, they would wear sort of like a robe, if you will. And if they wanted to run or fight or do battle, they'd have to pick it up and cinch it under their belt so they could move freely. And what trials do is they get rid of a, a lot of the rust. They get rid of a, a lot of the fogginess. They get rid of a lot of the unnecessary baggage in our minds. Right? Some of us, we have our eyes on the ends of the earth and trials just sort of give us a laser focus. And Peter says, yes, you're going through this. So gird up the loins of your mind. Right? Focus on the things that are eternal. Remember what Christ has called you out of and into. Remember that even though you're going through, quote unquote, hell on earth, heaven is coming to earth and will be fully realized on that day of days. And I want to just encourage us that we would be preparing our minds for action. How? By looking upon who God is, what he has done for us in Christ, and what he has promised us in Christ. And we prepare our minds by looking and gazing and trusting and believing. By being sober-minded, we set our hope fully on the grace that we brought to you when Jesus returns. And mysteriously and supernaturally, when we begin to, again, set our hearts and minds on the things above, our feet that are still tethered to this world, they begin to walk in obedience again. So I just want to remind you of these things. God has a purpose in our trials, as big or as small as they may be. Sometimes teenagers just go through the trials of low self-esteem. Some people have the trial of cancer, or maybe of children who have gone astray. Maybe there is overt persecution. I don't know. I just know the trials are varied, but they all have a similar purpose. To focus us on Christ who is returning and to enable us to walk in a manner worthy, to walk holily, which is why Peter says at the very end, I'm giving to you the gospel. This is good news of what Christ has done, what the Spirit is doing, and what will happen when Jesus returns. I think it's probably just helpful to close now but I wanted to give you this heavenly hermeneutic. This came to my mind last night. I, I, I want to just say, here, for you mathematicians, I want you to think about this equation in light of the text. Because I don't just want you to, to be able to sit and say, okay, I can, I can just eke it through this life. I, I, I want to summon us to a life of obedience so others might see our good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. I want us to abound in brotherly affection. I want us to live rightly together as God's people, but also shine brightly in this world in trial. So help me think through this. And if you want to correct me, that's okay. It's been a while since I've been to university. But help me think through this equation. Painful trials plus faith in Christ equals hope in heaven plus joyful obedience. Painful trials plus faith equals hope plus joyful obedience obedience. Painful trials are transformed into joyful obedience through faith and hope and love. But for hate, faith and hope to come about, we must fight for sight, fix our eyes, turn our eyes upon Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured such hostility from sinners that we might be saved. Well, we're going to do that as you're taking the table, remember who Christ is and what he has done. But remember, he says, I earnestly desire to partake of this cup with you. And I will when I return. There's, there's glorious past promises in the table. There's also future promises that God has guaranteed in this table. And so does, in the words of Piper, live by faith in future grace. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning... 
I pray that you would come to him. I pray that you would trust in him. In the words of Peter, that you would call upon a heavenly father who will judge each one according to his works impartially. And that you would then by faith seek to live the rest of your life in this pilgrimage in a manner that honors Christ. If you don't know Christ, the gospel summons and command is repent of your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not only forgive you of your sins, he will give you eternal hope. And with that, bringing in its wake, present joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Father, we ask for faith. And like the man at the bottom of the mountain, the disciples could do nothing. But you could, Jesus. And we would say, oh Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Oh God, we feel so weak, so frail. And we thank you, Lord, for exposing these realities to us this morning afresh from your word. For Lord, we are. We're dust, but not stardust, Father. We are those that you have set your love upon and sent your Son into the world to die for. And you will most certainly resurrect us and give us a body like unto his. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Oh, Lord, would you help us in our trials as we're groaning by the Holy Spirit, eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies, would you, would you help us to suffer well? And would we suffer in such a way that others might ask us about the hope that is in us and that we might be able to tell them about Jesus, the good shepherd and overseer of our souls, the one who brought us to God by his righteous and vicarious sacrifice. Father, I pray that if there's anyone even just wrestling with trusting you, would you triumph, would you overcome would you lead them, Holy Spirit, to Jesus even now? And for the rest of us, as we partake of the table, would you help us to do so by faith? It just looks like a piece of bread, a little glass cup. But Lord, this is an opportunity to reaffirm our trust in all that you are and all you promise us in Christ. Give us joy, Lord. Some of us have no idea about what I'm talking about because we're not going through trials. But for those of us, Lord, who are going through trials, would you help us in this painful trial to meet it with faith? And would you produce hope and joy and obedience in us that it would result in praise and glory and honor to you, Father and Son and Spirit, that we might walk holy as you are holy. Father, this is our desire. Please accomplish it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.